Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to see that there is such interest in this topic, leading difficult change. And we all know that change is difficult, whether it's in your personal life or in your professional life. So we definitely are looking forward to what uh, our presenters are going to talk about today. And uh, just some household items. We are at overcapacity, so please make sure that cell phones are on vibrate, that side conversations are kept to an absolute minimum, uh, and that uh, when you get to the end of the session, please take time to do the app and the evaluation via the app. It is very important for our professional development committee to have this data because it will help us strengthen next year's program. And then uh, I know that at breakfast, uh, Abby did remind you of how important it is to really visit our exhibitors. I cannot stress enough that the sponsorship for this conference and what we can do at this conference depends on our vendors. So please visit them and uh, have a, an engaging conversation because uh, it is thanks to them that we can offer certain quirks. And I'm going to uh, give it all to Van. <laughs> Well, good morning and, and welcome to this, which is really shaping up to be quite an exciting uh, presentation. Uh, for those of you who are joining us via live streaming, I'm going to offer an opportunity for you to participate. If you are interested in having a question posed to our panelists today, please email me at vwilson at vccs.edu, and I will attempt to insert your, your question throughout the, the conversation. I attended a, a presentation once and the title was, Change is Good, You Go First. <laughs> so I think I like that uh, much more than leading difficult change. So we have three distinguished panelists that are going to lead this uh, courageous conversation with you today. Uh, we have a uh, talented and renowned musician, songwriter, <laughs> and uh, artist. We have a former fundraiser, and we have a grandfather of 11. So I'm going to let you decide which is which. <laughs> but all who have assumed the, the mantle of college leadership. Collectively, we have, I think, just at about 100 years of ex leadership experience that's of here. <laughs> that's on that side of the Raising our ass. Close. That, <laughs> that's here uh, before you today. So I'm going to ask each to just give a few, just a few minutes of uh, brief introduction to you so that you'll have, you'll have a better idea of of who they are, and if they would disclose which of those three they are. <laughs> so let's start with um, President uh, Robert Sandel. Okay, thank you very much. I'm the uh, gentleman with the 11 grandchildren. Uh, I have four grown children and 11 wonderful grandchildren. Uh, I have been in the community college business most of my life. I'm from South Carolina. I was a uh, major uh, matter to my time was at the South Carolina Technical Education System. I came up to Mountain Empire Community College as president in 1992, came to Virginia Western as president in 2001. Uh, two wonderful colleges with, with outstanding people, uh, different sections of the state, uh, but uh, really those two, these two communities that I have been fortunate enough to work in have been very supportive of this college and what we're about. Um, I take pleasure in being uh, a member of the Virginia Community College system. Uh, I have, in my career, been in about every role uh, that you could have, uh, from a faculty member to a department head to a division dean to a faculty. I've been a faculty senate chair. I've been an academic VP. I've been workforce. Uh, and uh, it's, just, it's been a great experience. And probably one of the most positive things I can say is that the staff that we have at Virginia Western is probably as good as you're going to get anywhere. Our faculty and staff are a wonderful group. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rioni, I'm going to ask you to uh, chime in next. Thank you, and good morning. Um, yes, I'm John Rinoni. I'm president, uh, proud president of Dabney Lancaster Community College. I have all the Dabney people here, so I have <laughs> <laughs> I encourage them not to attend. <laughs> 
but um, I've been in the system just slightly short of three years. Um, prior to that, I have about 27 years experience in community colleges. I worked in two other states, uh, in New Hampshire and in Maine, and as you can tell from my accent, <laughs> Um, or your accent is different <laughs> than mine. Um, I'm a Yankee, so um, but I'm a Red Sox fan, so not a Yankee. So um, I um, I had the I w I'm the one that came up from a non-traditional pathway to the presidency. I was in workforce development. I did a couple of interim stints as CFO, as well as academic dean. But the last 13 years before coming to Dabney, I was a fundraiser. I, w I was the VP of Advancement, my previous institution. Um, I guess the, the, the unique thing about the previous institution was I went there and we had no students. <laughs> we were building a brand new college. And uh, President Gary Rhodes at Reynolds and I worked together and we were one of n the nine original employees. And um, so as a small college, when we started, we got to do everything. Um, and when I was searching for presidency and saw the description of Dabney, I saw exactly what I was coming from. And when I visited the campus and everything, I saw the incredible people we have and the, and the students, and that's what really attracted me um, there. So that, that, that was really my sort of non-traditional, but I got to start a brand new community college from scratch, which I always thought would probably be a once in a lifetime experience. And that leaves our talented musician. Uh, Bruce Chisholm, and I started off as, I've, in my experience, as an adjunct and a full-time faculty member teaching political science. Um, did that for a while, and then my path into the administration came via online education, distance education, video networks is what we were using at the time when we were moving into online. I was fascinated by that. And the uh, vice president and the dean supported me uh, taking a sabbatical and went and got my doctorate. To... From there, it was uh, up to Chicago, um, where I was an associate vice president of, of instructional technology, uh, tasked with building an online presence for that school, uh, and then uh, did three years as a vice president, academic affairs and uh, student services. It was a combined position. Triton College was a huge college. Uh, 18,000 students a semester, um, credit students, and uh, 25 or 26 percent of our credit hours were generated through ESL. Uh, it, it was a great experience. Um, if we get to the question of one of your most difficult change, although it's going to be talking about that college. Um, and then from there, I've had the opportunity and the pleasure to work in, so I Illinois as a vice president, and also in Texas. I uh, went just to outside the Houston system, Lee College, for a couple of years, um, and it was a great college, a great community tie. Exxon Oil, uh, the largest refinery in North America, happened to be there, and so strong partnerships with Exxon Oil. Uh, but the environment was so polluted, my wife's health took a, a downturn, so we left and went to Tennessee, where I was just outside Nashville for six years as vice president, did nine months as an interim. Never thought I really wanted to be a president until I had the opportunity to serve as an interim. I loved being vice president kinds of challenges you have to face and the relationships you get to build with people. Uh, but I so thoroughly enjoyed that that I, I didn't put a shotgun out to say, well, it's president or die, you know, I could have retired as vice president and been happy. But uh, I was born in Danville, Virginia, uh, and I love that area of the country. I was raised down in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and so the opportunity to come back into this part of the country is what attracted me, and so at uh, uh, Danville Community College for three years now coming on. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. So let's just cut straight to the chase. And I'm going to start with you, Dr. Rowney. This is a three-part question that I'd like to uh, get your, your thought on. The first part of the question is, what is the most difficult change initiative that you have led? Number one. Number two, what made it so difficult? And then the third part of that question is, what was the most important takeaway? What was the most important lesson that you learned from that experience? Dr. Rowney? Um, well, thank you, Van. Uh, I, I've, I've had this question for a couple of weeks now, and I'm not sure I can really necessarily pinpoint one specific thing, but I'll use my uh, arriving at, at Dabney as, as not difficult change, but I guess just as any president would come in, 
there are things that from my dip, from my experiences that um, I started to look at and, and process things and um, and we have changed a number of things and for example next fall we will begin a two day a week schedule and some of our faculty are here and there was probably some angst about changing schedules and and um, and really anything I've tried to do is really focused on on the student first and and on on uh, teaching and learning which is the pri you know is the primary piece um, you know we 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 what I've tr really tried to do is sort of look and evaluate and the first year I sort of treated it as a year of listening I listened to the community I, I listened to faculty and staff um, we had a lot of great you know we have a lot of great staff who have a lot of great ideas and for 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 a number of reasons maybe they were um, we didn't have the budget to do things um, but I guess my philosophy from the fundraising road is it's never no it's not now because if you work with a donor even though they may say no you know that doesn't mean that I can not go back to them later on so I've, I've sort of taken that same philosophy. So from changing schedules to really having a bigger commitment uh, for dual enrollment and actually putting dollars and putting staff toward that, uh, 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 even you know a bigger commitment to workforce development. So some of the some of the changes, not necessarily pinpoint things, but they were actually a number of things that were sort of shifting. I'm a big good to great fan, so I'm trying to push that flywheel you know and and you know and bottom line is our, our enrollment is starting to be increase instead of decrease and that's ultimately you know um, and I remind I remind faculty and staff more more enrollment gets us more dollars and then we can do m much more of these other um, uh, you know these other uh, projects that we really want to do uh, I have a million ideas and the the maybe the difficult thing is sometimes it's the resources but I try not to make dollars an excuse because I'll go find the dollars to do it it's it's the staffing it's the overburden of the staffing sometimes that that I have to be which sometimes is frustrating because you know somebody said would you rather have 10 more staff or a million dollars and I said I'll take the 10 staff because I think we can we can generate more million dollars by having more actual staff, more faculty, more services to students. So it's not a direct answer of one actual uh, change. I think it's a sort of a series of things, and that's what I've really tried to do. Is is I think you need to clearly focus on the students. You need to communicate and communicate and communicate. Um, and and you need to include uh, include people. I guess the 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 one the one complaint I've had is I've I asked too many people their opinion. <laughs> and 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 but that's the way I am. That's that you know that's my process. So you know that buy-in is really important. Very good, um, Dr. Sandel. Would you like to respond to that uh, same yeah, series? Yeah, I, I looked I looked at a. Um, a number of scenarios. I could have talked about nursing program culture. I mean, I could have addressed that. I could talk about the credit and non-credit meshing that we're doing now. As many of us remember, we could talk about the PeopleSoft implementation when that came aboard. That was that was quite a uh, quite a change. Um, but I wanted to talk about something that's pretty relevant right now, and that's the move to the shared services concept. Um, uh, a central location for shared services. And that decision has been made now where that's going to be, and that's going to be in the uh, southern part of Botetourt County, which is one of our uh, service area uh, regions. Uh, they wanted to put it in the rural horseshoe, and Botetourt fits into that category. Uh, so the shared services complex, which will eventually, over a three-year transition, go to about 200 full-time employees, uh, it's about uh, five minutes off the interstate, not but about 20 minutes from here, uh, and so that's you know that's going to happen, and I'm and I want to 
make sure that you understand that's a, that's a big change, but that is, it's going to maximize efficiencies, and I'm very supportive of that. I mean, I'm very supportive of the uh, student services concept of changing changing process and expectations. I think I think this is this is a forward thinking idea. Um, it, it is needed to be. I think if you get 23 community colleges and a, and a system office and you've got everybody duplicating services on so many aspects that the cost per transaction is just out of sight when you compare us to top businesses and so forth. In other words, we're just exponentially so much higher to do things. And then the larger colleges maybe be more efficient than some of the smaller colleges. In other words, we need to get all of this under one heading. And this is a transition, and this is a um, major change. Uh, it's a change um, because it's going to what? It's going to have some personal impact. It has some personal impact. Uh, and now that it's been said to be located in this, this region, folks around the whole Commonwealth seeing that, that's maybe too far away or whatever if I wanted to be involved or whatever like that. Um, and, I, and as I said, I believe in the maximizing efficiencies and I believe in the higher expectations we're going to get out of this. I think this is a, it's a good thing, and I think the three-year cycle is sufficient to make this transition work. Uh, some of the things that impact employees, one is uncertainty, you know, uncertainty about is my job going to be impacted? How is this going to impact me? That's human nature. That would, that would impact all of us. Where is the location going to be? I mean, is this going to be right around the corner, so maybe I could, you know, maybe I could apply there, or is it going to be three or 400 miles away? Um, and then as a college, as Virginia Western, you know, I, I had to stop and look at this from a, quote, more selfish perspective. A lot of my good people may want to go 20 minutes away to the shared services facility. So I could be, so I could get cherry picked of some of my best people who may eventually go, go right around the corner here. Um, and I don't want that to happen, you know, I, from a selfish perspective. I, I want what's best for the employee. If that's best for them, that's fine, but I, I would, would like them to stay where they are. Um, I think what we tried to do is we tried to keep everybody informed about what's happening. We made a, a concerted effort to get a point person. We got our VP for HR as our point person. She's terrific at making that happen. She's been very upfront and informative to all of the employees about what's transpiring with this shared services process. Um, so there's been no misinformation out there. Everybody felt that they were involved. Um, uh, we tried to be very transparent about everything that's going on with this shared services facility, even to the point that I just said, I'm very supportive of it. I mean, I'm supportive of what it's about. Um, We've been very timely on our information. We tried to, whatever we know, they know. I mean, our employees know. And let me just preface one thing. 90%, and my staff knows this, I always say it all the time, 90% of what a president does is deal with people. In other words, we have the staff that does the dot and I's, cross the T's, and makes everything work. They make it work. We're the ones out dealing with a lot, of, as they do also, but 90% of what we do is deal with people and that is the most critical element of success, is how you deal with people. And you want to have a happy workforce, and you want to have high morale, and you want people to feel included, and you want to have collaboration. And, and those are not just uh, bywords, those are things that have to happen. Um, and you have to be consistent on your information. You can't say one thing one day and all of a sudden come from left field the next day. Um, Employees need to be aware of what's going on and they need to have a voice. If our employees want to speak up about this and ask questions or whatever, great. We, we want them to be able to do that. Um, and then finally, um, one of the things we have done as, as, a, as a college, we're looking at if, these, if this does happen over a three-year basis, we're going to be very proactive about um, looking at uh, if, if positions did get affected, that these may be affected more by attrition uh, it could be more by reassignment and so forth. It wouldn't be a just all of a sudden, this group of people, you're not here anymore. We're going to try to do everything we can as far as uh, shift people, stay till attrition happens or reassignment, whatever may happen. We don't know exactly how this is going to play out yet impacting people. It may be a great impact, it may not. But I think that, that, that is quite a change that's coming about. Shared services is a big change in the VCCS. VCCS. 
but it's a good change if we do it in the right way and the system working with the colleges is making that happen. So I feel very good about where we are at this time. Very good, thank you. Dr. Sisson? Um, well, I think it's not so much that we're in a difficult period because I think you're always in a difficult, my entire experience in higher education has been a difficult period. <laughs> 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 but I also think that, um, you know, if you're doing your job, trying to lead, that is, in effect, you are always changing something, right? If you don't change, you're going to just become stagnant. Somebody's going to march right past you. Uh, and so you want, to, you want to be always looking, where's the best opportunity for the greatest number of students and businesses and so forth? And so there's a lot going on in Virginia right now, and I could talk about one of the contemporary, but I think that I'd, I'll focus more on, in this remark, on my experience at Triton College when I was the Vice President of Academic Affairs and Student Services, because it was one of the first experiences that I had ever had really in, a, in what would be regarded as a hostile atmosphere. And to try to maneuver and to effectuate change in a hostile atmosphere was quite uh, a feat. It, it, it's not something I did alone, I'll guarantee you that. But to just to paint it up here for a moment, it was a local board, Illinois has local board control, uh, and our local board was uh, chaired by a gentleman and, and several of his compatriots who would lose no sleep at all. In fact, it was a point of pride if they could sit in a public board meeting and curse at the faculty publicly, have them there in the room to single them out and point them and curse at them. The uh, Sachs, it wasn't Sachs, so it was the equivalent of Sachs, but the, the, the HCL, uh, learning from HLC, uh, had sort of gigged the college on its previous uh, accreditation visit on this lack of a collaborative relationship, this hostility between administration and faculty. And then so there I came charging into my first real administrative position, you know, excited about that. And then realizing what I'd walked into, mm -hmm. it was kind of, whoo, gosh. And so, but what it taught me more than anything else was that, you know, you can't do anything alone. The, 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 what you really are doing is trying to appoint to a better future and trying to make sure that that future, the one thing that you can get everybody to agree on is what's good for students. If you start talking about what's good for faculty in their job or what's good for the classified staff in their job, you get all kinds of divisions. You just can't resolve those necessarily in and of themselves. But everybody, and even in, a, in Illinois and at Triton College, Chicago, a very strong union environment as well, they would grieve you at the drop of a hat um, you would be in meetings with faculty members and uh, oftentimes their first comment would be, my contract doesn't say anything about being concerned about student well-being or student progress. Mm -hmm. So how do you negotiate that? It was, essentially it was, what can we do that would best serve? Let's don't talk contract issue. Let's don't talk. Those are impediments. Let's figure out where we want to go. How could we make this relationship stronger and better? You could go into a curriculum committee meeting that was a, clearly a curriculum that had outlived its usefulness, a program, no students, no graduation, no revenue, full-time faculty member, and you could not get any support from the curriculum committee to do away with that program because it was always couched in not on the merits of the conversation, but it was on a administration versus faculty, us against them, and that was the nature of that environment that I walked into. So I was tasked with and hired to build an online presence for the school. They didn't have one, they wanted one, needed one as you moved into that realm. Uh, and then also to try to govern because we were getting ready to come up as well for our next accreditation uh, visit at the college. And so I set about really, and the most valuable lessons I learned at that time were really the importance of getting with people as individuals trying to always point the way forward to a better tomorrow and then try to chart that path how to get from here to there. And the, I think the really the only thing that works is people do want to change. People are hesitant, they're intimidated by change, but most people will accept change as well if they can see the reason why you're changing, if they can understand the importance of what it is that you're trying to get to. People will buy into change. You need to find ways, and as I learned, to give people security that change will not impact you negatively. This is an experiment in some regards. If you're moving forward to do something new, we're all going to be learning. And we won't hold mistakes against you if we have planned well, if you've taken the best information you can. So the key is to get people involved. Let the faculty 
And I found it useful to find the faculty who had the least trust in administration and include them in the conversation. Not to be dominating the conversation, but to include them in the conversation. But you had to get your advocates as well and the proponents and then just listen to everybody. You're not going to get what you want as an individual, but you have to be patient and you just have to keep pointing toward progress and build on successes so that people can walk away from the, uh, the table and feel like, well, you know, we did gain something. People don't mind compromise. I mean, Washington is a, probably a lesson in, <laughs> right, in what not to do. People don't mind compromise. It's, it's fundamental, I think, in the DNA of an American to be willing to compromise and listen to other sides. That was the most important lesson I learned. The ability, the need, the critical need to work with people and include their vision thoughts and be patient and to accept that it will wind up different than you had originally envisioned it, but by the time you include other people, it's going to modify and let it happen. Keep your eyes on how you're going to know whether you're doing something right and agree on those kinds of terms before you go so that as you start moving through that, admit you're wrong if the data is not pointing you in the right direction or admit that you need to shift your thinking a little bit. Be open and willing to learn from other people. And my experience has been people will go about anywhere you need to go if you, if you do that. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. So looking across the audience, I see a lot of um, either very young baby boomers or older millennials who I'm sure have aspirations to be in a leadership role. So if you could just tick off your list of what skills and abilities are most needed to lead difficult change and complex change. So um, Dr. Rioni, I'll start with you. Well, it's funny, I had just come back from um, AECC this past week, and, and one of the most popular sessions was around the Generation X presidents. Okay, and, <laughs> and yes, and, and um, Ted is there, and I'm on the border of it, so I, I, I'm a little fickle as I was described in Chicago. So. Um, I think that, that one of the keys about, about change is, again, I think if we're in this business, you've got to focus on students, as both of my colleagues have said. Wh whatever we do, wherever we go, it has to be about what's best for the student. And, and sometimes I think we all lose sight of that. But we need to keep that focus, and the leader has to keep that focus on there. Um, you know, something that Bruce said earlier uh, reminded me of the, the old book of Getting to Yes. Uh, and they talk about the, the, and you know, and my feeling about that in, describes in this book, I don't care how we get to the place we need to get to, if we can get to it. So bringing collaborative efforts is important. So with, whether we go down this road or that road, we end up in the in a different direction and I know this is all basic stuff but sometimes I think that leaders and I've worked with great leaders and I've worked with less than great leaders um, they forget that I think they forget that um, I'm also a big uh, John Carter fan from Harvard and he really talks about his his eight eight levels of change is defining reality okay and the one thing that I've tried to do at Dabney is share everything. Share the facts. You know, this is what this means from, uh, from state appropriations, or this, would, this is what this means. And, and, but then it's my, it's my responsibility to know the facts and make data-informed decisions based on that, okay? Um, and I think that that, that sense of urgency that Carter talks about is really, um, uh, you know, as Bruce said, if we don't change, we'll die. And, and you know, and that changing component, I think, is, is really important. Very good. Dr. Sam? Okay, thank you. Um, I think very important is, I think we all understand, you have to have effective communications. Um, and that's very simple to say, effective communications. Um, but we have to have it across the board throughout the institution. People have to be updated on what's happening um, and, and what's going on in, in a way that they feel very comfortable with. Uh, leadership that has established trust. 
you know, and that's, that's essential, uh, that folks have to believe in their leaders and they have to trust them. Trust to me means that when you say something to this person, you don't go around and say something different to somebody else. Um, trust means that you give respect to your faculty and staff and students. You respect them for, for what, who they are, what their issues may be. And trust is something you can't buy. I mean, you, you have to earn it. You just can't say, I'm a very trustworthy person. No, you, you may be, but you got to earn it. You got to earn it with your folks. And you earn it by your daily actions each and every day. Collaboration. Um, I've got a, a senior team that's very big on collaboration and they want to make sure that, Sandal, you, we are collaborating here now. We are involving everybody in the process here. Uh, and that's important. You got to have a team that you trust that they're going to make sure that we're moving in the right direction as, as a group. And uh, that's essential. You know, you can always say people rarely um, welcome change. And Bruce was mentioning some about that, you know, but I think if they see the real value of change, people will buy into it. Um, you, can't, you don't want to have change for change's sake. You want to have change to make a real difference. You know, we talk about how we change the lives of students. We make, all of us make a real difference in student lives. That's, that is the greatest change we do. We make a great change for, for, for students, but we can make a great change in everything we do in an institution. We have to remain flexible. We have to keep our goals in mind. But we also, flexibility to that is, whatever those goals are, we have to be able to say that we can tweak those goals as we go along. It may not be exactly the way we thought it was going to work out, but we, we would tweak it uh, as, as we move forward in the process. Um, I think training is essential for support staff. In other words, you can't have enough training, guys. You can't have enough training. Training means you go over the do's and don'ts, the regs, everything that's, that's everything that's whatever the issue is about, that people have a full understanding. You're only as good as your people. You're only as good as your people. The most valuable components in any institution are your first line supervisors, the people out there that rubber meets the road. I mean, you know, you know, higher administration can get caught up in a building a lot, but the folks that you really got to depend on and, and should be out a lot, but they, they don't always. You got to depend on those people who are out on the front lines, meaning in the classrooms, your, your, your deans, your, your directors, your coordinators, all your faculty members, they're out there and you got to be in such a situation that they feel very comfortable relating back to their supervisors what's going on and what positive things are happening and what negative things are happening. Happening. You want to address issues early if you find anything going wrong. And let me tell you something I do. I do this with business and industry people. I do this with anybody I talk to. If I'm doing something wrong, tell me. Tell me. If I'm going in the wrong direction, tell me. If I've said something that offended somebody, tell me. Because I certainly didn't mean to do that, but I can't correct or shift anything I do unless I know I don't want people, and I used to always say this at Mountain Empire, I don't want people to fester. Don't <laughs> fester. That's one of my terms. Don't fester. Don't sit here and just build up this resentment because you just can't get it out. I want you to say it. Say it. Uh, you got to do it. You know, and I think um, communicate the rationale behind the need for change. To explain to employees why it is important. This is not rocket science, but you'd just be amazed how many people don't do this. They don't do this. Explain it. Explain the rationale. Do those things. I mean, it's not that hard. Implement change in phases. I don't think you need the big, what is it, the uh, cough syrup all at one big spoonful to take a little bit of time. Just do change in phases. Show success. Success breeds what? It breeds more success. Once people get a taste of success, they want more of it. And you get, your institution is full of people who want that success at any different level it may be. It can be on the grounds looking nice, it can be in the classroom, it can be in anything there. People want to see success. And I believe um, you should have a pilot group to start it off. You know, have a pilot group. Let's test this thing out. Let's kick the tires. Let's, let's touch the car a little bit here. Let's kind of get a, a feeling about how this is really going to go as kind of a pilot model. You'd be surprised what you may learn from that. You may also be surprised of how 
you got some constructive criticism up front about how you could do this in a much smoother, easier way, and you said, I didn't see the forest with the trees. It was right there in front of me all the time. And I always say this, if all else fails, ask your customer. If all else fails, ask the students. You know, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. And I know this, faculty will tell you. They'll tell you too. <laughs> <laughs> they will tell you. That's why you better have a good staff, because they'll tell you. Um, and I'll finish up here. Leadership, leadership, leadership. You don't buy it, you don't make it, you earn it. What real leadership is. Maintain the scope of the change. Also, and I mentioned, I got here written speed. In other words, how fast is all this going to take to get done? Is this a never ending process or is this something we can get done in a certain period of time? Take ownership for it have the resources to do it, and reward people for the successes they have. You do those things, good things happen. Very good. I'm going to give um, Dr. Skizzle a chance to uh, respond, and then I'm going to open it up to hear uh, your questions and, and comments. So, uh, and I'll try to be very brief so we can get to the questions and the comments. Um, uh, and the question was, if I can rephrase it, Brandon, what are we looking for in the characteristics and people, right? That yes. we right. Right. Okay. Um, I, I like folks that are doers. I mean, I, I think in, you know, it's, it's management structure, and you can have two kinds of personalities, essentially. One is the manager. I'm an effective manager as long as I keep shuffling papers, and I've been to the conferences, you know, where they say put five dots, and by the time you get to the fifth one, you've been too long. So, or you can have the people that I think will lead with a vision, and I would much rather have the latter. All right. I, I, I care more about somebody that is not going to be stymied by, well, I was going to try to do this, but I couldn't get so-and-so to give me what I needed from them. Or we made it, oh, we got a little closer, but it was over here that they just weren't, that, that is not what you're really looking for. You want to try to find people, or at least I do, that know how to, so if that's an impediment, how are you going to get around that impediment? Ultimately, you are going to be held responsible for achieving. And so knowing that there are obstacles, you can stop a conversation by just starting to talk about the obstacles and nobody has the energy and everybody wants to go home. So what are those? How do you work around them and get people enthusiastic? So I look for doers who will be accountable and have accepted accountability for success in their own lives. Uh, I look for folks that have vision. So what do you think is going to be the most important change? And do people start talking about is it the change that made this work or that work, or is the change that they're focused on more based on how we're going to more effectively serve students or serve more students or better responsiveness to the industry that needs something? So I want that kind of a visionary thinker as well, somebody who's willing to be experimental and just say, we've never done that, or I've not seen anybody else around the country do that, or, man, if we're not quite ready here, everything's got to be perfect before I'm willing to move forward. Uh, it just that's too much, right? So you've got to do the best you can, the best thinking, the best planning with the best data, know where your goal is, anchor it to student success, and move forward. And be willing to correct course as you move, so as you learn what's working and not working. You want people that will say no. Um, as often as possible, you want to tell people yes, because obviously if they're coming to you with an idea, they're, they're passionate about it. So you want to be yes as frequently as you can. How can I support you? And I think it was the comments that you were making, Bobby, earlier. How can I support you and to do your job better? That's one of the critical roles, I think, of a vice president and a president. Uh, how can I help you do your job better? But you have to be willing to say no. You can't let people intimidate you. If something is not working, you've got to stop it. You can't. And I think one of the strongest things you can do is to, it's difficult, one of the most difficult changes is personnel related because those are never pleasant situations. And you don't want to walk into those uh, if you can avoid walking into them. But at the same time, when you know there's a problem and other people know there's a problem, you're better to deal with the situation because more people around you will have respect for you for having dealt with a difficult situation than if you just simply try to ignore it and hope it'll go away. So you, you don't do anything until you absolutely have to. You've got to try to reach out and help move people along. Those are what I'm looking for. I want people that are willing to embrace change, and, and I've made the great point, not change for the sake of change, but change because it's going to lead us to a better tomorrow. And then 
how are you going to determine what should be tomorrow? And I always try to focus it back on, I've had the greatest success when you can focus it on it's going to work better for students. That doesn't mean that what you're doing today is wrong. What you're doing today may be the foundation and the seeds of something that could be strengthened tomorrow. So you don't want to throw out necessarily in change. You want to build on. It's like, so I'll, I'll try to be succinct. <laughs> I, I wish we had like part A and part B of this conversation. <laughs> Uh, we, we do have a few minutes, and I, I just wanted to pause to see if there were any comments or. Uh, can, yes. Can you just wait till the microphone gets to you since we have the <laughs> audience outside? <laughs> yeah. I want to thank the panelists, the leaders, uh, for this wonderful discussion of experience and uh, change. I have a question for all of you. Which uh, type of change is the most difficult to manage? That which you initiate, or that which is imposed upon you. <laughs> and we are on a time constraint, so <laughs> <laughs> a brief response. You got Let's it, John. You started. Uh, well, I think I, I, I think um, I think it's a little combination of both. But in some ways, you have to be sold if it's put upon you. But if I initiate something, I own it, and and hopefully you will, you can build the coalitions that we've talked about and so forth. But I also feel like you know the leadership key and everything else. What I've told my management team is disagree, argue in this room. But once we once we leave, we have that that united front. So they may disagree with that change because it's imposed, but. Hopefully, and the expectation is that there, there is that unified front. Any other comments? Yeah, if, you go, if you're going to be part of a system, you're always going to receive um, uh, mandates and other issues right. or, or directions you're going to have to follow. That's part of being part of a system. A system works well if a system works as a system. In other words, we're in this together. We're going to do what's for the better, 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 um, for the, for the larger number of folks involved, knowing that we don't always please everybody. And remember, leaders, you're not going to always please everybody. But you want to do what's right. You want to take whatever direction and guidance you're given as a president. You want to disseminate it through your organization. I mean, if you're going to be a president in this system, you're going to buy in to whatever the system, because all that's going to be vetted before it ever becomes. The presidents are going to vet it with the chancellor and the state board before anything comes out to the to the masses of, of, of employees and students. So we're going to buy in. But when you buy in, you buy in. That's right. And you know, it's like we say when we have a discussion behind closed doors, we may disagree, but when we go out the door, we're all on the same page. That's the way it's got to be done. Because you, you are a team player. You're doing for the greater good. And you may not always agree with all aspects of something. But ladies and gentlemen, we don't agree with all aspects when we go home, do we? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I mean, life is that way. We, don't, we have to compromise, as was mentioned. We have to do some things. But we do what has the greatest positive impact on our students with a, if, if you're going to be a part of a system. And then on the other side, I think that, is, that, that, that can be done. And on the other side, if it comes from the president's office, anything there is going to be done. It's going to be worked out through that institution and massaged and talked about and tweaked and everything else before any type of direction becomes in that. I'm going to make sure the players are on board and they see the value added for what we do. You only do it if it's going to be value added and make a difference and a positive difference in your institution. Oh, I, I think they're both, and I agree with the, the comments about that. It's, it, the most critical thing, I think, is to, is to when, there, when there is change that's imposed on you, is to try to have an understanding of why people are asking you to change. I mean, your, your supervisors, your bosses, they have the obligation and the right to do that. And if you can sort of internalize why would they want to achieve change from their perspective, you don't have to agree necessarily, but it helps you to try to understand the perspective and to find then within that how you can benefit from that. You're going to go that way. I think ultimately, though, and it's the same whether you initiate change or not, the processes then have to be the same in reaching out to people and getting people on board. I think one of the most difficult things is to realize perhaps when you cannot effectuate that change, 
that if you have, if, if you think that what they're asking you to do is just absolutely not right, then you have, and, you, and if you can't effectuate change, then you have to make a decision in your professional life about whether you belong there anymore and be willing to move and do something else if you, if you feel that it's egregious and, and it would violate your morals or your integrity or your professionalism. Uh, be willing to go as long as, when you reach that point, if you cannot effectuate change. Uh, but Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. I have done a terrible job facilitating this conversation today. I just need another hour. Well, we can stay. <laughs> yeah, but we can all stay. So, so uh, panelists, any one last uh, party shot uh, before the, in the, the session ends? Um, we have about um, uh, one minute left. <laughs> so um, I, I, let's start with uh, Dr. Sism, and then we'll work back this way. Uh, I, I have none, but I'd uh, be willing to answer any questions if anybody had. I don't know one minute wisdom. I'm, I come up empty, so I'll, I'll pass it to John. <laughs> um, I would just say in anything you do, the, the, the most difficult, uh, when there are issues on campus, nine, nine out of ten times it comes down to lack of communication. Yeah. And if you remember nothing else, yeah. and you may have to communicate multiple ways, even sky, sky writing if you need to, <laughs> but, but it comes down to the lack of communication. Yeah. And the very last word goes to you, Dr. Sandel. Well, I think it's very important that uh, we surround ourselves with good people. You're only as good as the people you have. Give them, you know, I always say this, I don't micromanage my folks. I get out of their way, I let them do their job, and if they need me, I'll be their greatest supporter in whatever I can do. Everything goes well, give everybody else the credit. Anything goes bad, you absorb it. And that's the way it should be. If, if, give everybody else the credit, support them, give them, give them that leeway they need, give them that freedom to be creative and innovative and make mistakes at times. Um, they appreciate that. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, you, you need, if you want to earn respect, you gotta give respect. And I think that's the way it works. So I think that's just a, Good people make a difference. Make a difference. Ladies and gentlemen, help me thank our panelists. I'm I'm going to go off script and say I'm quite sure that, that they would be more than willing to continue the conversation with you throughout the, the conference. So please uh, take advantage of that. And, and thank you for participating. Yeah. Great crowd. That's in all of you here. <laughs>